miraculous things. Jesus has the power to calm the seas, the wind, the rain. They all obey his voice. He has the power to cast out demons and evil spirits and has given us the power to do so in the name. He, he, he heals people. He, he cures these diseases. Even from, even some from birth. Beyond all of these, has the power to to deliver people from sin. And now he says that one of us, the men that eat and drink with them, will betray them. How can anyone that doubt that he's our Messiah? He's come and torn, turn to us. How can anyone turn away from us? In fact, 
At one time, I thought this would assure me a position of power in the new kingdom. My mother even suggested that I should sit at Jesus' right hand when he claimed his throne and John at his left. After all, it was we who went to the mountain invited with Jesus. We saw him transfigured. His face shone like the sun, and the voice of God spoke out of heaven. He chose me. He chose each of us. How could any one of us betray him? We've seen his perfect adherence to the law. We heard the voice of God say, This is my son. We've been present at countless miracles, healings, works no mere mortal man could accomplish. Could it be my brother John? Could it be me? My name is Matthew, and before I became a disciple of Jesus, I worked for the government of Rome as a tax collector. In that position, I uh, took advantage of one of the perks. I would skim money off the top of the tax donations for my own personal gain. <coughs> them, I deceived them, I stored up a treasure for myself here on earth, but stored up no treasure in heaven. But I've changed. Since following Jesus, I know that was wrong. I even held a huge banquet in my home and invited other members of that corrupt government to come and meet him and talk with him and hopefully be changed as I was. But now that there's a traitor in our midst, I wonder, will the others think it is me, a known publican, a sinner? Lord, is it I? Simon. Before Jesus called me, I was a member of the Zealots. We believe in God and that God alone rules over this holy nation of Israel. And we refuse to pay homage or taxes to any Roman governor. It goes against my nature, but Jesus teaches that God ordains all powers and governments on earth, allowing them to rule over us. And we must give our due and treat them with respect. Since following to Christ, I've learned to channel my zeal into telling others about Jesus, God's Son, and reaching out to people for His kingdom. Is there a spy among us? A Roman, perhaps. How could any follower of Jesus question His power and authority? He is God. He is our King. He is greater than any government. Could I somehow revert back to my old ways? Could I, Simon, betray my King? Lord, is it I?
of John the Baptist. With my friend Philip, who first told me of Jesus of Nazareth, at first I was skeptical. Nazareth, dirty, filthy, moral place, what possible good could come from Nazareth? But then John said, he was the Lamb of God, here to take away the sins of the world. Then I met Jesus for the first time. It was as if he knew my innermost thoughts. As a devout man, I knew what he was offering was more than anything I had ever seen before. For over a thousand years, we've celebrated the Feast of the Thanksgiving, remembering the bitter slavery with the bitter herbs, remembering the ten plagues with the ten drops from the goblet. Remembering how the blood of the sacrificial lamb caused the angel of death to pass over the Israelites, self-saving their firstborn. Remembering how the Israelites fled in such haste that they could not bake leavened bread, but instead baked unleavened bread by the warmth of the sun. And now Jesus offers this unleavened bread and says, Take and eat, for this is my body. And he offers a cup and says, Take and drink, for this is my blood. Oh, what a wonderful story. Jesus, is it I? My name is Philip. Jesus came to me one day when I was working and said simply, Follow me. I spent an entire day with him and I was convinced this is truly the promised one. It has taken some time for me to understand that this man, this fulfilled promise, is actually God here among us. Recently, thousands of men and women, families, were seated on the hillside listening to him. Jesus asked me where we could buy bread to feed them all. At once, I thought only the actual physical cost of such a venture. Why, our treasury does not hold such funds. I gave no thought to the people's discomfort or to the possibility of a divine miracle. But Jesus, oh Jesus, he took five tiny pieces of bread and two tiny fish. He prayed over them and broke them into pieces. He fed thousands, and we collected 12 baskets full of leftovers. God, here among us. Who would deny the promised one, this divine presence here in our midst? And to whom would this person deliver Jesus? To the vain and arrogant priests who refused to believe God has kept his promise? Or to the pagan Roman government that fears a rival ruler? Could any one of us forget his power, his compassion? Could I forget? Is it I? His hands, hands of a carpenter, rough. Brethren, but yet so gentle. His hands reached out, touched the light, and the disease was erased from their body. His hands touched Peter's mother in law, and her fever disappeared. His hands reached out and lifted Jairus' daughter. From her own deathbed, his hands had opened the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf, mended the limbs of the lame and crippled, countless infirmities, illnesses, deformities, all gone. His hands reached out to the little children when others brushed him away. His hand reached out, pulled Peter from that churning sea that would have swallowed him up. 
his hands. Breaking bread. Giving thanks. Praying. Such simple gestures. But yet so profound. His hands have shown mercy, kindness, and love. His hands have served me, Thaddeus, and all my brothers. His hands, praying to his Lord, God is truly in this room. We have all received the blessings from his hands. We've all seen the miracles those hands have performed. Someone is going to betray him in the hands of the enemy? Could I, Bartholomew, betray you?
John. Beloved disciple. Beloved. Loved by Jesus. Loved by the one who's in the beginning with God. Loved by the one who is greater than all of us. And yet, washes our feet. Say an example of humility and servitude. Oh, you might think because Jesus calls me his beloved disciple, that I have a reason to be proud. Oh, how I've learned the opposite is true. I once thought I might hold a place of power and prestige in his kingdom, but he has shown me over and over that the war he wages is a spiritual battle. He reaches out to the needy, paupers. He does not seek out the rich and powerful. He dines in the home of sinners and common folk, not the elite. I want Saul to be. Befriend a well-known Pharisee and an immoral woman for giving birth. God sent his son because he loved the world, the lowly, me, so much, so much that he does not want any one of us to perish but to have everlasting life. This Jesus, he is the way, he is the truth, he is life. You know, even though we are his closest friends and followers, I don't think we understand the depth of his love. I believe he would give his life for mine. How could I, John, not do the same? Will my pride cause me to stumble? Will I betray him? Jesus speak around this table tonight, I simply do not understand. Words meant to comfort, met with words of misunderstanding, talks of betrayal, met with words of disbelief. Sometimes I marvel that I, Thomas, have seen my Lord and Master with my own eyes. I have touched him with my own hands. I have witnessed to him perform miracles and change lives. But how can we follow him if we do not know where he is going? Is there something that I have done to contribute to this betrayal that he speaks of? Does he see my lack of faith? My doubts? My fear?
I have Judas Iscariot, the treasurer for this group. I have followed Jesus. I'm growing tired of his reluctance to take a stand against our oppressors. Oh, I believe he is who he says he is. But why would God send a Messiah for this, to, to wash feet and, and to serve bread? I have no need of a spiritual king. We need a political king, one who will rise up and overthrow these Roman tyrants. Thousands of people follow him every day, over mountainsides and across rivers, just to hear him speak. Surely he could raise up an army in no time. Something must be done to force him to make his move, to lead us to victory, to establish the new kingdom. A betrayer among us, indeed. All these men look at one another suspiciously around this table, wondering, guessing, accusing. They look inwardly and ponder their own motivations. But why do they sit here like sheep waiting for a shepherd? Someone must do something. Well, I have. Tonight, the elders and the chief priests will help me, help him, usher in the promised kingdom. History will thank me for this. Oh, yes. Someone has betrayed him. Perhaps all of us will do so before this night is over. Master, is it I? 